Good morning, everybody. Good to be here with you on this beautiful September morning. Starting to see hints of autumn in the leaves, right? It's going to be a little cooler coming up, which is nice. We have, uh, years ago, I saw these flowers and I really loved them, and I told Lisa I wanted them. They're super tall. And we found out it's a form of black eyed Susan, but they're called outhouse flowers because they used to cover the outhouses. So we, uh, we have a massive patch of them behind the kitchen and through the window this time of year when all the petals fall off, all the goldfinches come and they just, they hoard it and they just pick all the seeds out so they can fatten up. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's a black eyed Susan, but it's kind of like a sunflower, but it, to me, when I see that happening, they're not bright and pretty bright yellow anymore. They turn spotty because they're molting. All right. We are going to continue with our study in Romans chapter 12. If you want to turn over there. <clears throat> I said before that I thought we were done with the first couple verses, which we are going to be. And we're going to this morning, look at verses 3 through 8. <clears throat> at least we'll begin to look at them. And today, uh, the topic that we're going to look at is going to be unity. Well, mostly, we're going to discuss uh, humility as a way or a means to get to unity, to be unified. So let's read verses 3 through 8 of Romans chapter 12. We read, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or if he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives, with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we are thankful that we are able to gather here uh, together today um, to read uh, the Bible, Lord, your words that you have given uh, to the Apostle Paul, um, inspired him to write for us uh, things about you, uh, things that we can read and take uh, and apply uh, to ourselves each day as we try um, and live and, and hopefully surrender to you, Lord, to grow closer to you uh, so that we can be the purpose that you have for us, for each other and for the world uh, and help us to take these things uh, to heart, help us all to look at them individually uh, and decide for each other or each person uh, as they read, what they what they take from it, uh, what you give to them, uh, and and they may they be faithful, and we be faithful uh, with these words. Amen. So in a kingdom, and that's what we're talking about. Remember, we're we're in message number seven, and we're talking about a commitment because that's what chapter twelve starts with a commitment to the gospel. Of the kingdom because the kingdom was good news right Jesus talked about the gospel um, in different ways but a major way that he talked about it was in regards to the kingdom coming or the kingdom being uh, at least starting to see it in people uh, as he was looking and in a kingdom unity is the expectation uh, you know, if you have a king and he's got his, his men, his government, and they go out and they govern and they keep the people uh, according to the laws, according to what is expected of them, and they keep them together. 
if there's anybody that rises up and tries to go against what the kingdom says, or the king is saying, I guess depending on the kingdom, they try to use different means to keep those people in line. And of course, if they can't, they remove the person or the people who are causing disunity. So unity is important. Without unity, if you have a purpose together, if there's disunity, you can't fulfill the purpose. The purpose kind of falls by the wayside because everybody uh, gets into why there's disunity um, and trying to restore it one way or the other. So Christ says that we're free. We're free in, he says in Galatians, that he's made us free for freedom's sake. We have liberty. How do we maintain unity? And that's some of what Paul is saying here. Much of what Paul writes in, uh, you know, I just, this morning I thought of Ephesians when he goes through the way that we ought to live, or Corinthians, or any of, any of his books really, when he goes into how we're supposed to live together, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to carry ourselves, they all come down to love. And the places that he talks about people aren't following or aren't loving, that's what it comes down to. The, when people are acting as they should not, then it comes down to a lack of love. So going along with verse 1 of chapter 12, <clears throat> we have a call for self-sacrifice. Although the words self-sacrifice don't come in, if we read uh, verse 3 again, it says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. In order not to think more highly of yourself, <clears throat> you have to sacrifice of yourself. Because you're, there's going to be a desire, we have a desire in ourselves to... Uh, to put forth what we want, what we want to talk about, what is important to us, rather than the other person. Uh, and it takes work not to do that, right? If you're talking to someone, you ask how their day was, and they start telling you, in your mind you start thinking, oh, that's kind of like what happened to me, or oh, this happened, or oh, my day was so much worse. And you're, naturally, you want to say those things, right? When really, you should just listen to the other person. And hopefully the other person will be humble enough when they're done speaking to say, well, how was your day? And then you can say, say it however you want. Uh, but that is not thinking more highly of yourself, and that takes work. It takes an amount of self-sacrifice. So if we have people thinking more highly of themselves than others, then there is no self-sacrifice. And then other people are thought of as less, or having gone through less, or not as important. Uh, and then we lose humility. So others that we think of would be, our, would be others outside of ourselves that we're speaking with. It could be others in the group. Uh, one commentary I wrote, which I thought, wow, I, every time I read this, I keep all I think of is other people. And he said, what about Jesus? Right? He is Jesus. Are we more humble before him? Uh, you know, some of that comes in with prayer. When we pray, how are we praying? You know, are we just praying for all the troubles of our lives and how horrible everything is to somebody who lived life as a human being and paid an amazing price um, for our freedom in him? So. Yeah, I think that's interesting to think about it that way. Uh, not just people, uh, but even God, our creator. So when Jesus says to love your neighbor, his intent is that you love them like he loves them. Love them like God loves them. Be humble to them the same as God was humble to us, right? By sending his son. Uh, let's turn over to Philippians. And we're just going to read chapter 2, 
in verses 1 through 5. We often read this, and usually, or many times when we read it, we read 5 through 11. But I think this kind of mirrors what Paul is saying in chapter 12 of Romans. He says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, and then you can continue and read what Christ Jesus did. What was his attitude? His attitude was one of humility. Uh, and that's what Paul's point is here. He says, be intent on one purpose. United, together, in spirit. That's uh, uh, properly, in my Bible, I believe, a lowercase s. Be united in spirit. In the spirit of what is expected in the spirit of what we're doing, in the spirit of Christ, in the spirit of what uh, his church was uh, founded for, which is for the kingdom, which is to manifest God to the world. Paul is saying, be intent on that point, unified. And he, if you look at what surrounds that intent on one purpose, what does he talk about? Talks about humility and compassion and love and affection. These things are all part of humility and they're all needed if you're going to be unified in one purpose. You think about, I mean I've said this before, but if you think about if you had a group of people and they all had needs, and everybody was intent on being humble before the other and meeting everybody else's needs, somebody is also doing that for you. Now everybody's needs are met. We're all in it together, unified, and in that, all of us should be thinking about what the other person needs. Uh, I'll say needs, not desires. What we need, um, that's what it's about. So even the highest of the high are to follow the example of God, which would be to bring themselves way down. So even if you're in a group and there's a millionaire there, that millionaire would say, I am the same as everybody else in here, or even lower. And, and I'm gonna meet, work to meet the needs of people as much as I can. Um, that's humility. That's exactly what God did. So. The opposite of this arrangement, we experience all the time. And the opposite, what we said a few minutes ago, was people who have a me first mentality. That's, you know, I say, I'll say that's the world's, in general, that's the world's mentality, right? Uh, it's, you know, when you're driving down the street and you see billboards and there's something that you want, oh, well, I want this, and it starts to override other things in your life and it becomes the number one thing uh, when you walk into a group uh, you know some people of a, a certain personality just let it go and they come in they take over everything um, you know even when you're you know if you go someplace and you're looking for seats and you see some empty seats up front and you see other people going and some people will speed up and start walking and push through let me get to those seats and all these things seem simple Right? They seem little, but you know, you know, it's out of the heart is what we speak and do. And so it's where we are. You know, I, I think about that and I think, well, is that always true? I mean, we, what do we teach kids when they're growing up? We teach them to be humble. We teach them to you know, care for others before themselves. And we do all those things. And even as adults, we echo these sentiments. You know, I've, 
I've uh, work of taking classes that teach these types of things, right? Um, we know in our minds, we know that we're supposed to do it, but you know, we forget and we let other things take over. It's difficult um, to be to be humble. It takes it takes work. Uh, there are some people that are. I don't say there's nobody that's humble. There are people that are humble, but it's even for them. I bet it takes work. It's something they work at. Why don't you turn over to First Peter chapter five? In verse 5, it says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, according to Peter, the young people need to be subject to their elders, but everybody needs to be humble to one another. Clothe yourselves with humility. Kind of like Paul says, clothe yourselves with love. Put it on. So it's what people see. Uh, that's what you see when you look at somebody. You see their face and you see the clothes they're wearing. Clothe yourself with humility. Make it something that's obvious. It's something that can be seen by others. Because, according to Peter, there's a complete opposite. It's interesting, there's not a gray spot in between it's either you're humble or you're proud right uh, he doesn't want to give any thought to well they were kind of humble today they did say something proud but we'll go with the humble it's either or so paul in ephesians oh, i already said that so it seems likely as though love and humility to me are very close uh, to being the same. Humility is a necessary toward, step towards love as defined by God. In Job 5.11, we won't turn there, but it says that God exalts the lowly. And we know from what uh, Jesus says that the point is not, it's not a, it's not something of fairness. He's just bringing the lowly up. Um, on the same plane as the high. In Ezekiel 21, 26, it is said that the turban and the crown will be removed from the king of Israel. And the high, which is the king, is going to be made low, while the low are going to be made high. One commentary said this was a picture of the human king Zedekiah, which is the topic of Ezekiel 21, 26, being made low while Christ, who is lowly, is going to be made high in the future. So the human king who was ruling the kingdom that God had a purpose for that didn't happen is going to be removed and made low. And interesting, after those kings disappeared and Israel went into captivity and Judah went into captivity, there is no more king. There were people that ruled. Um, there were people that were made king or made high by Rome, but they were never again on their own. And Christ came, and it was in absolute humility, and made his point to hang out with the low instead of the high. Uh, in Ezekiel 17, 24, why don't you go ahead and turn over there. <clears throat> It says, all the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. I will bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green tree, and make 
flourish and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will perform it. Now you could read the verses ahead of it, uh, which I did not completely read for you, but you have things about um, taking a sprig and planting it uh, and removing, let's go ahead and read up in verse 22. It says, thus says the Lord, I will also take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and set it out. I will pluck from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one and will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the high mountain of Israel I will plant it, that it may bring forth boughs and bear fruit and become stately, a stately cedar. And the birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. I bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green, and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord, I have spoken it, and I will perform it. So cedars uh, in Lebanon, cedars were very tall, beautiful trees at one time. And so he's taking a sprig out of it and then going up on a mountain and planting it, and it's going to grow. And so what's it going to be? It's going to be taller than the other ones, right? Uh, and then it's, it goes on to say how he's going to take the green trees and make them dry. And the dry trees he's going to make green. That's chapter 17. Yep. So, uh, again, this is not a, a point of unfairly pulling one and tearing down another. It's a point of taking the high and bringing them down to where they need to be brought down to. Um, you know, it just popped in my head. There's a, uh, a song by a group, an older group, and it's called Trees. And there's some oak trees and maple trees. And the oak trees are big and beautiful and lofty. And the maple trees aren't as big. And they want sunlight. So they start crying out against the oak trees. Give us more sun. And the oak trees, of course, say, no. We are who we are. You are who you are. Live with it. Well, it goes on, and there's this big fight between the trees. And someone comes along with an ax. It cuts them all down. Right? So now they're all the same. They all have to start all over again. And maybe they'll grow to reasonable heights for each other. I mean, that's, I, to me, that's God's idea of making humble. You think you're something. I'm going to bring you down so you're lower than the others, and you can learn humility. Um, and I think that's, that's what God's point is. It's a matter of the humble remaining humble. No pride. As Peter says, God, as we just read in a few verses, is opposed to the proud. He's not just opposed to the proud just to be opposed to proud. He's opposed to the proud for a reason. And it's not just because their pride goes against him. It's because their pride is working against other people that they should be in humility towards in working in unity. So let's turn back to Romans chapter 12. I'll read verse 3 again. It says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. When Paul says sound judgment, he's talking about your sound judgment, not your sound judgment about over other people, about your sound judgment to yourself to make sure that you're remaining humble. So that's, it's his way of saying, think about it. Think about what you're saying, what you're doing, how you're carrying yourself, and how it appears to others and before the Lord. You want to remain humble, and it takes some thought. The measure of faith here is not that people receive different amounts of faith. Uh, some people see that. They say, oh, well, each one gets a measure of faith. You know, I was listening... Uh, 
to my Christian mix um, while I was doing some work on the house and I'm listening to it and and one of the songs is someone asking God or telling God that maybe I didn't get enough faith because I'm not thinking the way I should be about you the other people seem to have it give me the faith that they have increase my faith but that's not the point of this verse we all have the same faith that's the faith of Jesus Jesus Christ on the cross Jesus Christ and his faith in his father um, to carry through what he said he would that's the faith that we have uh, you know a lot of times um, we read that you know have in the Bible we read having faith in the Son of God or faith of the Son of God and we we decide is it am I supposed to is it talking about the faith of the Son of God or is it talking about me having faith in the Son of God um, I think we could take it both ways because obviously we also have to step out in faith or have our own faith um, about things and have faith in things but we are given a measure of faith and the reason that Paul states that is because he doesn't want anybody that's reading this to come out and say everybody here is striving for unity and everybody's so humble I just can't live this way I don't have enough faith to live this way God hasn't worked in me enough to make it happen and Paul is taking that away and saying no judge yourself and make sure that you're performing it because you have it in you it's already there God has put it there for you you can do it if you don't do it it's because you're just not thinking about it like you said judging yourself you're not doing it what you're not doing what you're supposed to do because you've lost track of who you are so Paul is saying basically that everything that you need to live as we're expected to in unity in the kingdom is already in you it's already there you just have to exercise it and part of that being a living sacrifice that he talks about up in verse 1 is humility so I said we were going to talk about unity in Matthew 12 25 Jesus says and knowing their thoughts because he's healed somebody or he's done works and they're saying he does it of the devil or Beelzebub Jesus says and knowing their thoughts Jesus said to them any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a city or house divided against itself will not stand nothing that is not unified in some way or another is going to thrive it's eventually gonna it's gonna lose its prosperity it's gonna fall down it's gonna crumble um, whatever you might however you might want to think about it we can think of all kinds of examples in history of things like that uh, you know Jesus says a kingdom and then he says a city or a house you think of a house uh, that's divided against itself you, I don't know if he's got the purpose here but you think back then the house the king's house if it wasn't unified uh, and his sons were against him and they were fighting each other and one of them eventually kills the king and it falls apart right and then the kingdom ends up divided those things happen all throughout history and so Jesus point is uh, you got to be unified and he says any kingdom and when I read any kingdom I'm like well what about God's kingdom can it be divided against itself and the answer obviously is going to be no it can't be God's kingdom is not going to fail however that does not mean that there's going to be an appearance of failure due to its inhabitants disunity you can have a nation on the earth we have nations on this earth that are very 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 old and they've gone through things right they've had this unity but yet the nation still exists because there is an underlying unity of the people you know the, their nationality um, the foods they eat what they drink how they live it's it, 
the area they live in, could be surrounded by mountains, could be anything that holds them together. But that doesn't mean that the entire time when the outsiders look in, they look unified. They might not look unified. And I think we see the same thing uh, in God's kingdom when we are not unified and when we fail at humility. Um, we're going to turn to Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians. I mean, I don't know what happened to the church in Corinth when I closed my Bible and I stopped reading about them. I don't know what happened to them eventually. Maybe you could read that somewhere. I don't know. You know, I read about, we did uh, Colossians a long, we did some stuff out of Colossians a long time ago. We read about the history of Colossae, right? It was a vibrant community that eventually disappeared. And the communities around them survived. And it had to do with, just had to do with the location. They weren't in a location where it was easy to do trade or anything with them. They were off the beaten path. And so eventually it just kind of fell apart. And you wonder, what if the people of Colossae got together and made a way for it to happen? Could it have happened? I don't know. Maybe they did. But maybe they weren't unified. Maybe that's just part of the reason why uh, their city disappeared. Um, but Paul is concerned with Corinth, uh, the church in Corinth, in its unity. He says, it, starting in verse 10 through 13, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was not, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? <clears throat> so somebody, uh, Chloe, or Chloe's people at least, are telling Paul there's stuff going on here. And it's causing division. So when they're all clamoring over each other to say who they're under, who is more important than the other, that's what they're doing. They're breaking themselves up into groups. And they're saying, well, <clears throat> some are saying, well, we're following Jesus Christ. He is supreme. He's the one. And then someone else says, no, I'm following Paul. Paul is our teacher. He's the one writing the letters to us and telling us about the things of Jesus. And Apollos and Cephas, I mean, they're going all different ways. And by doing this, not only they're pitting themselves against each other, but they're taking the work of Christ and of Paul and Apollos and Cephas, and they're breaking that apart. When Paul, Apollos, and Cephas are probably pretty closely knit and united together. And these people are taking little things that they're saying and they're, they're breaking it up. They're destroying the unity, which is going to destroy the faith that's in the other, other people watching. It, it takes it and it makes it to the outsider like, this Jesus, this is one of his following camps. Look at it. It's, it's in disarray. It's a mess. Why would we want to be part of that? Uh, you know, people come in the door, they're invited to someone's house, and they're going to have a meeting, and it breaks up in quarrels, and of course that person never comes back again. So Paul is asking, and I think he's stating at the same time, he says, is the body of Christ divided? And of course he's saying, the body of Christ is not divided. It is together. That's why we're to be together. In that passage, in verse, uh, in verse 10, he says, there should be no divisions. 
we're all to be complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. This doesn't mean that when one of us reads, <clears throat> we'll just pick any passage, Romans chapter 2, they see it one way or they see something from it and someone else picks out something else and says, oh yeah, but it could mean this too. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about unified under Christ. Unified for the purpose of God's kingdom. That's the unity he's talking about. The other stuff comes down to humility. You hear someone say something they think about a passage, have humility if you think differently. That's all. And maybe at another time where you're together, you can share what you think about it. And then maybe you could talk to each other about it and see a commonality or look for things in it. That's humility. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, just turn a couple pages over. We're going to start in verse 3 and read through verse 8, and we're going to start um, after the end of the sentence from verse 2. It says, For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave the opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now who he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I think that's a very interesting passage. The first thing that, when I read this, that as I was doing this, is, am I a mere human being? You think of a human being, and then all they're made up of, physically, mentally, everything that makes up you. Are you just a human being? Or are you a special human being? So Paul is telling them they are something. But they're acting just like they're nothing by being divided. I just think that's a neat thought. Uh, and he says it again uh, later down in the passage. The way they're acting. Are they just mere men? Are they just humans? Or are they spiritual? Because spiritual is what we're supposed to be. We were made for more, and we're made for more, not for ourselves only, but for others. So that others can see it and say, there's something different. There's something a little more about that person that I would like to have. I would like to be that way. So when we divide ourselves as higher than others under one group or another person, person we sow discord. Uh, you know... Jesus talks about loving. Uh, and he says, you know, when you greet a brother or sister, anybody does that. Even the Gentiles do that. What makes you different? That's what God is looking for. He also goes on to say things like, he's nobody. Him and Apollos, according to him, aren't anything. It's God that's really doing the work. We live as we're supposed to live and attract others into that, uh, like we, we said months ago, alternate, alternative society, a different way to live. And when they get there and they start to become like us or become like that or become unified in the same purpose, it's not, oh yeah, that's the one I brought in. And then the next person's like, I got five to come in. Paul is saying, no, you're nothing. You, they came because you were living and showing who God was, who Christ is. And then God took that person and worked in them uh, to get them to where they were. 
he also says that not only are they not anything, but they're the same. So the one who brought in, if Paul brought in 100 people from Corinth, and Apollos brought in 20 people, it doesn't matter. They're the same, the same. He says each is going to receive their wages or reward. And if you keep reading through the chapter, you're going to find the reward is not again one person gets more than another. It is simply your act of living towards, with grace towards each other in your humility, humility as you work in the kingdom of God, you will pass through the fire and what is going to remain. That's going to be what your reward is. It's not that one person gets more than the other, right? Paul says once he earns, he's earned a crown of righteousness. I used to look at that and I think, wow, is Paul going to have like a special crown that I'm not going to have? And then I thought one time it occurred to me like, wait a minute. Everybody right here are going to have a crown of righteousness, right? God sees us as righteous. He sees us as he sees his son. So again, it's not one or the other. It's together in unity. So... In Revelation 21, 25, it says, In the daytime there will be no more night. Its gates will never be closed. God's kingdom, the gates of his kingdom are always open. And, you know, you look at it like this. You're on a pilgrimage. Right now, you're on a pilgrimage. And your pilgrimage is to be what God wants you to be like you were walking up to that kingdom and it's walled and it's beautiful and the gates are open and you're finally ready to go inside. That's what we're working at. That's what we are today. We're walking to be conformed to the image of his son. We're walking to live as he desires us to live in his kingdom. And are we unified? Wouldn't it be great if if that was the case and you're walking up to it and all of us were here together, even the people on Zoom, we're all together and we're walking up the hill and we could all go through the gates together. Wouldn't that be awesome, right? That takes humility and unity to make that happen, to make that pilgrimage together. And I think that's what God is asking for and that's what Paul is asking for when he tells the people in Corinthians, Corinthians be together, be of one mind, be together. So some ask about the thousands of theological belief systems and many denominations. How can they all be in the same kingdom? But they are, they're all in the same kingdom. They all have a base unifier and that's Christ. That's it. That's the unification. All of them have different beliefs and varying levels of commitment requirements. And I think all we can do is to do our best, as Paul said, and use sound judgment and make sure that we're seeing that unity and not letting it break down like we see in Corinthians. Let's turn back over to Romans chapter 12. I turned the wrong way. Verses four to five, four and five says, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we're members of one another. So as people, subjects of God's kingdom, even though each of us is different, we each have different talents, different things that Paul is talking here about gifts, maybe some have different gifts, whatever it might be, it's all of God. And we're all together. Like he says elsewhere that uh, it's the sinews and the cartilages and the bones all growing together to become one. That's what we are. 
So we are one, rooted and grounded in love. And when Paul asks in Corinthians, why other divisions? The subject of the divisions really doesn't matter. It's just the fact that there's divisions. Um, I have a note here about Paul talking about eating meat that came from a sacrifice to a god, little g. And that was a big thing, remember, in Corinthians. He's saying, put it aside. You know, eat it, don't eat it, but don't make a thing out of it. That's humility. So we take that and we spread it over everything that we are, and we work the same way. So with all these different denominations, it's the same thing. You could start with theology and work down the list. It could be theology, it could be sports teams, politics, people, way people dress, lifestyle, you know, people's weight, what they eat, whatever. It doesn't matter. You work down and you find the base, the common ground, which hopefully for us is Christ. God says in the prophets that every mountain in Isaiah, every mountain is going to be made low in every valley made high. That doesn't mean that the mountains are going to become the valleys. That means that it's going to be a plain. They're going to be the same. One of our prime jobs as the people of God are to be the ones who seek to unify. That's our job. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, I was talking to my brother. We went uh, to Boston this week in the car and we talked a little bit about politics and I said one thing about politicians is every one of them they get up and they say they want to unify I want to bring the country together and I always think to myself no they don't because if the country was all together then what would be their point they need <laughs> they need someone on the other side so they can vilify them and get more people on their side. That's, their, that's what they are looking for. Um, that's not how we want to be. We want to be honest, humble people in Christ. And we want to work together humbly and unified. Amen.